The park is rich in more ways than one. Not only the present generation will see and enjoy its grandeur and the pleasures it affords, but by conservation and care, it will afford pleasures to generations yet unborn. These words were spoken by the Honorable M.T. Bryan on July 4, 1912, as he presented Shelby Park to the City of Nashville on behalf of the Parks Commission. The nature and beauty that drew the citizens of Nashville to Shelby Park in 1912 are still attracting people here today. Over the past 100 years, Shelby Park has seen iconic structures lost and trees taken by storms, but the people who cherish this urban treasure have not lost their love and appreciation for the peace and joy it brings to their daily lives. In 1890, a real estate land company purchased the property that makes up much of Shelby Park today. The company ran an amusement park that offered roller coasters, picnic grounds, tennis, and boat rides. The amusement park could be reached by use of the trolley streetcar lines that ran down Shelby Avenue and Fatherland Street. A portion of the park site up near the community center was used for a time as a private amusement park. And this was not unusual. There were other uh, parks like this um, in other parts of Nashville at the end of streetcar lines. So it was sort of a, uh, a motivation for people to get on the new streetcar, drive to the end of it, um, see where these new neighborhoods were being developed. It was kind of a sales feature or a, an attraction sales component for these new neighborhoods being developed at the time. The company that owned the amusement park went bankrupt in 1903, and its creditors were ready to find a buyer. The park's commissioners voted in 1909 to purchase the land needed for the park, and by 1911 the purchases were complete and development began. Major E.C. Lewis, a parks commissioner and a professional engineer, designed Shelby Park and the structures located in it. His designs included a Spanish-style mission house, log cabins, and Sycamore Lodge. Major Lewis was experimenting with reinforced concrete. And he used this material in the design of the Dutch windmill, the boathouse, and the sulfur well that can still be seen on the path coming from the entrance at 19th Street in Fatherland. My grandfather used to get water there all the time. It was clean, good drinking water. That's where Lockwood Springs got the name from, because it got so many springs. When it rains over Shelby Golf Course, you can see springs just spouting up all over the place. Historically, Cave Spring uh, was a place that people could go to cool off. Of course, they <laughs> were wearing probably very heavy head-to-toe woolen clothes, no air conditioning. Um, so uh, a, a place where you could go to cool off in the middle of the summer was even more important then probably than it is today. Uh, so that site was actually very uh, carefully designed. It also had some concrete structures at the upper end of it that were also designed by, by Mr. Lewis. When I was a kid, we had Sycamore Lodge, the missionary house, uh, the windmill. Sycamore Lodge was constructed of cedar logs and was one of the most memorable structures in the park. It opened on August 24, 1912, and was rented for picnics and family and church gatherings. It included a cover on one side to provide shelter for automobiles. By 1978, it was in need of great repairs and maintenance, and in 1984, it was dismantled and moved to a Boy Scout camp outside of Gallatin, Tennessee. My uh, grandparents uh, volunteered with Salvation Army and, and uh, that group used to have a lot of dances and they would have dances there. Sycamore Lodge is, uh, used, to, used to be where the uh, bridge is now, right next to the bridge, where back, back in the 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s and early 70s, people would reserve it for picnics and family reunions and high school class reunions and they'd have dances there. My mother and daddy used to go there dancing when they were dating back in the late 30s, early 40s. When, when I think about the Sycamore Lodge and, and also think about um, the, the marine area there with the, you know, the big area that's shaped like a boat, you know, the kids always enjoyed that. The boathouse was a unique feature of Shelby Park. It was constructed to look like the front of a steamboat and was positioned on the edge of Lake Sevier. Park goers could rent canoes or paddle boats and enjoy being out on the lake. 
it was like an old uh, river boat. You could rent paddle boats out of it, and I remember doing that. And I think there was a concession stand in mm -hmm. the front of it. I remember getting a snow cone there, and uh, it, it was just the coolest thing. There, there were some paddle boats, yes, and um, you could, you know, rent them and really go out into the middle of the, the lake there. It was quite exciting to see the families going out on a Sunday afternoon and, and having fun. The Dutch windmill was a full-scale replica of a windmill in Holland. People could climb the stairs and enjoy the view of the park from the walk around the balcony. It was located atop Windmill Hill, near the Iris Garden. Although the windmill was destroyed by fire in the 1940s, the stone steps that led to it are still visible today. Major Lewis designed the Mission House in the Spanish colonial style. It was one of several rest houses available for rent in the park. The Mission House included porches and a lounge area that was furnished with Mission-style furniture. Like the windmill, it too was destroyed by fire. You know, back in the day, people used to, to drive their cars to the park, you know, get some of those old Model Ts, you know, let's take a ride through the park. So, you know, now it's more pedestrian traffic, but it, the, the way it's laid out is great. In Shelby Park, all of the existing roads are what was designed and built in 1919. The Shelby Golf Course was the first municipal course in Nashville. It opened in 1924 as a nine-hole course, and over the next six years, additional acreage was purchased to extend the course to a full 18 holes. The course is still open today. The golf course, Shelby Golf Course. I caddied over there, played golf over there, just like my father, he caddied over there and played golf over there too. But that's my favorite part of the park, it was Shelby Golf Course, which is the second oldest course in Nashville, besides Bell Mead Country Club, and it's the oldest public golf course in Nashville. The first nine opened in 1924, and the second nine opened during the Depression. I think the WPA workers helped build the second nine. The Scotchman's Golf Course was a free public course that opened in 1928. It was allowed to fade away during World War II due to manpower shortages, but was reopened in 1967 as the Riverview Course and is now known as the Vinnie Lynx. The nickname of the Vinnie Lynx, as I call it, was the Scotchman Course when it first opened. That was a nickname for it, Scotchman Course. And then when it reopened again, when the close reopened again, it was called the Riverview Golf Course. But the course has been there since the 30s, but they closed it up for 20 years and they opened it back up and Vince Gill and Bill Friss and a bunch of others got together and raised about six million dollars and they redone the whole golf course and built a clubhouse for that in taxpayers' money. The park and all of these facilities provided the perfect backdrop for childhood and family fun and it remains a source of wonderful memories for many Nashvillians. My favorite memory is feeding the ducks. We loved feeding the ducks, um, just standing around and just um, watching the ducks and, and, and watching the kids have such a wonderful time with us. Sometimes we would fish, um, either from the lake or from time to time, you know, from the river itself. The Chevy Park swimming pool. Now, I love that. Oh, we, that was a big ritual every Sunday afternoon and all day on Saturdays. The Chevy Park swimming pool right next to the community center where the dog park is now. My favorite memory is, as a child, running free when we had family picnics. Um, and then as a teenager, it was meeting over and having picnics and climbing the railroad trestle. My mom <laughs> climbing up the, I, I still find this hard to believe, but apparently it's true. She climbed up the railroad trestle when she was 16 and then a train came by, so she kind of hid underneath the, the track. I don't know if she wants that. <laughs> Did she tell you? Disclosed. Okay, all right. As a kid, I used to ride my bicycle over to the park a lot. My brother and I would tie bags of bread on the handlebars of our banana bites and feed the ducks with the, with the old bread. And, and I just remember when the kids would ride their bikes down to Shelby Park and use that little curved area. Then as a young mother, my boys played um, Little League at Jess Neely League. Well, my favorite memories of Shelby Park are uh, really all surrounded around baseball. Every Saturday, the park was jammed, families were all around. The noise, the sound, 
the, the screaming, the bats, the everything, that's all very vivid for me and, and is really was one of the more formative times of my life. So Anderson was this little, I'm sorry, uh, was. very small There's white kid. There's no way kid, to get around it. Right, he was this very small <coughs> white kid on a team that had been handpicked of these great kids from Shelby Park With and elsewhere. Several professional athletes Who, on yeah. uh, the, the team. Yes, and so he would, you would go out and you would see them huddled up on the field and there <laughs> were these people like so tall, so big, ebony black skin, and here's Anderson, this little white kid with blonde hair and spiky hair. I think I had glasses then, too. Spiky hair. <laughs> well, the first game of the state tournament of some sort, was mother sad. was out of town, and dad, and you, I'm sure you were there. Oh, there. We were sitting in the bleachers. Anderson was the first batter up. First pitch, he hits it over the fence. Now, hitting it over the fence for his team was nothing because these other kids hit it over the fence like every game a million times. But for Anderson, that had never happened. No. And my dad was like a gorilla jumping off of the bleachers. <laughs> he was like literally leaping around the outside of the baseball field. And I remember Anderson coming around uh, second base to third base trying to be all cool. And Timmy Ray was on third baseline and he had a grin ear to ear. Dad's going bananas. <laughs> and that is just one of my clearest memories of Shelby Park that still just makes me crack up when I think about well, it. Well, and, and the, the General Jackson is oh, yeah. one of the... Um, and my most vivid memories of playing baseball over here because back in whatever it was, it was in the early 80s when the General Jackson was new and it would come down and it was like everything would stop yeah. um, when the General Jackson passed down the Cumberland. My daddy used to take me, my sister, and my mother to the lake early, I mean early, in the morning and there were no pavilions around there. There were just a couple of little barbecue pits. And he would cook breakfast. So we would eat breakfast at the lake, and then I can remember that so vividly because he would take the skillet once he was through it and put a coat hanger in it, take it up to the lake and dunk it and cool it off and then put it in the car. And we'd, we would have eaten breakfast by then and we'd leave. You know, growing up in, in East Nashville, uh, Shelby Park was an amazing place. We had Thanksgiving breakfast at Sycamore Lodge, and we always had a fun time because we got there, and my mom and dad would help cook. And so that meant getting things warmed up because Thanksgiving breakfast was always a cold morning, and there was still a little ice on the ground. And then the guys would get there from the church, and they'd start playing flag football outside. So it was a youth group, usually, and we just had Sycamore Lodge filled with kids and good smell and bacon cooking and sausage, and we had a good time. That's one of my favorite memories of Shelby. We, uh, my family and I, we, we used to come down here and just go through the park, play ball. Used to, I used to coach here back in the early 80s. And uh, used to coach my own son, actually, on the team over here at Just Neal Athletics. Uh, we used to come down here all the time, throw frisbees, and just watch everybody playing. Had a good time down here. To, to think about both how different things were in terms of the families we were around and in terms of the sheer size of some of my teammates. One of my teammates, who I'm still very dear friends with, he's like family to me, um, that season, our 12-year-old season, drove himself to games <laughs> as a 12-year-old. Um, but he was in fact 12. It was He had working parents and he was big enough that if he were driving down the street you sure wouldn't think anything about it. But uh, he's selling cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> for many, Shelby Park was more than a place for childhood fun. It was and is a place for community. To meet and fellowship with friends, neighbors, and new acquaintances. To build relationships and find a home away from home that feeds the need for activity and comfort together. To find peace in a public space that is open to all. We felt very comfortable in the park. So many good memories. It is a place where community happens. It's a place where people come together. I think Shelby Park is a neat sense of community because of the fact that it's everybody's backyard. It's, it's relaxing to me, you know, and anytime I get up tired or something like that, I can just ride around Chevy Park and park and read and kind of relax. It really did feel like home. So what it means to me is, is 
that we share this amazing backyard as a community. You know, for me, parks in general, and Shelby Park in particular, um, provide so many benefits. I mean, they, it, uh, Shelby Park really has enriched so many people's lives over the decades. You just felt comfortable with your children being there. You're there, visiting with family and friends, and um, it, it just felt like you belong there. Everybody needs a place of peace and this is that place. In 1915, Dr. A.S. Keim of the YMCA organized the park system's first athletic league. The tradition has continued with Jess Neely Athletics, which began in the 1960s. The programs are dedicated to teaching self-worth, developing young minds, and promoting team building through organized sports for youth in East Nashville. It just needed started here in the 1960s. It started out with football, and later it, it, it took on baseball. Jess Neely gave back to the community like um, no one would ever realize unless they were involved in it. I think youth sports are very important uh, in the community. A uh, place where kids can go and have fun, be outside, not inside, playing those video games and you know, get a little exercise and have time for families to come out and have good family outings. If you didn't have money, it didn't matter because somebody sponsored your team and uh, somebody helped you get on a team. And um, it was one of the best experiences for my boys because it was diverse. And we, um, we loved the mixture of, of people and of parents. And um, even though it got a little bit animated on many occasions on the competition, that was another thing to learn was how to be a good sportsman. Enjoying neighbors as well. So while the, the children were practicing or playing a game, it, it gave me time to visit with neighbors. Several former Major League Baseball players played, played there. And I know that there were four, one being, well, one being Ron Mercer, who played on my son's baseball team, went on to be a pro basketball player. I'm just saying that in that it's the foundation that they were given uh, through the coaches, through learning how to play together, work together, and learning how to deal with diversity. We created an environment, uh, a safe, fun environment, that this park is, is a special place to be. We wanted just needed to be a special place. You always want to come there. You know, it's a lot of fun. You can tell your friends about it. They come. Friends come and watch friends play. It was so wonderful to have the dads playing on one field while the little ones were playing the little league on another field. Lake Sevier is a relaxing and inviting place. It offers a source for meditation, daydreaming, or simply catching fish. Many young people have tried their luck at catching the big one in Lake Sevier as part of Bill Covington's annual Shelby Park Lake Junior Fishing Rodeo. Covington started the Junior Fishing Rodeo in 1973 for children 12 and under, and every child received a prize regardless of the size of their catch. The Junior Fishing Rodeo was an annual event for 25 years, and at its peak had over a thousand kids participating. Back in those days, we did the fishing rodeo yeah. every year. Yeah. Bill Covington. Bill Covington. Yeah. yeah. In 1973, my fiance and I were riding through the park by the lake. And there were four boys, about 10 years old, thereabouts, fishing with an old piece of tree limb and a great big balled up mess of monofilament line, if you <clears throat> know what I'm talking about. And they were trying to fish. And I had a rod and reel in the trunk. Um, so I told my fiance, I said, you know, that, that's just sad. That, that is sad. So I opened the trunk and I gave, I said, y'all use this, you know, equal amounts and you can have it. And I said, but now this is like on a Tuesday. And I said, what if I had a fishing contest out here Saturday uh, for guys your age, so let's say 12 and under. And that's the way it started and always stayed. So I got a couple of my buddies and we bought some Cokes and uh, you could buy a zip code 202 rod and reel then for six dollars. So we bought 20 of them because we, we anticipated 20 kids. Well, we had about 75 kids. That was the first one. Well, I realized that 
uh, if it were promoted properly, you, you, you know, you could get all the kids around the lake to come. And then we all put our heads together and I said, look, we, you know, we're going to do this correctly and we're going to do it every year until we get tired of doing it. After the third one, we started averaging over a thousand kids a year. But what we found out was most of them showed up and had nothing to fish with. So we're, we're learning as we go. We actually cut a thousand cane poles and they were all cut right down here in the bottoms, right along the river bank. So um, uh, we're putting those to good use. And we got the line and we rigged them and put the hook on there, the smallest hook you could buy to keep them from getting injured. And then we had a look, you got, a, you got that when you signed up and you got a little cup of dough and a little cup of corn. And it was your bait. And, uh, and it worked. I mean, they caught all those catfish out of there. So when you got there, you signed up, and before you got your bait and stuff, you got an orange drink and a donut. Then at lunch, you got a hot dog and potato chips and, uh, and Pepsis. I, I, I loved every minute of it. It was a lot of work, but I loved every minute of it. For those who enjoy Shelby Park's richness on a regular basis, it has the feeling of a second backyard. The park is a place where one can find peace, serenity, and food for the soul. Shelby is used as a source to re-energize your spirit after a long day, or as the perfect environment to reflect about life. People from different backgrounds and areas come together in this sacred space and enjoy nature, fresh air, and peace of mind. The park is like my backyard, but it's also everybody's backyard. It really did feel like home. East Nashville's backyard, so it's everybody's backyard, and that's how it's used. I go down there and read for two or three hours, just read. Just park over by the river or by the lake and just read. It um, is a place to fill your soul. So it was, it was a, a calming effect. I think, uh... This is sort of like safe ground. When I come here, uh, it is a sanctuary. Everything's peaceful and quiet. It's, it's relaxing to me, you know. And anytime I get up tired or something like that, I can just ride around Chevy Park and park and read and kind of relax. If, if it's really a stressful week, I might just drive through on my way home. I've been here so many times, it just feels like home. It has everything. You play ball, you cook out, you, you stroll, you run, you do whatever, whatever it is you do. And you do it in um, the backyard. It is a place where people can nurture their relationship with the outdoors. It's a place where people can get fit. It's a place where you can go and meditate and reflect and be alone. Uh, we felt very comfortable in the park and uh, so many, so many good memories. When I go to different parts of it, I can remember the family reunions there. I can remember, you know, sports and riding my bicycle and all that sort of thing. It, uh, I'm proud to say that I grew up in the park. And I think with, the, with all of the things that's going on in our lives today, it's, it's very rare that you can find a place you, that, that brings comfort to you. And Shelby Park does that. It's a, a way to stay healthy emotionally, spiritually, and physically. So when you think about Shelby Park, you think about the residents or the individuals that had the vision to really think of a structure such as this or, or a place such as this to come and enjoy. They, they had uh, those of us that are enjoying it now in mind. For 100 years, Shelby Park has provided a safe location where the community can create lifelong memories and friendships. It's a place where the citizens of Nashville have found a refuge for becoming physically, spiritually, and emotionally fit. It's a jewel in the middle of a city, and with great care from all of us, it will continue to provide these blessings for another 100 years. This park is rich in more ways than one. Not only the present generation will see and enjoy its grandeur and the pleasures it affords, but by conservation and care, it will afford pleasures to generations yet unborn.